Hello, I'm Josh Adet from Roaring Penguin Technical Support. This video is intended for administrators who are about to deploy Canit. We'll go through the most common deployment options and discuss them with the aim of helping you decide the best path to move forward. Canit is a powerful product which can be used in many different ways. The most common is to have one quarantine per person, so we'll spend most of our discussion on the options related to this kind of deployment. By the end of the video, you'll have a clear understanding of how to go about deploying Canit for your domain or domains. Before you watch this video, if you haven't already seen it, please go and watch our video on Canit terminology. We'll be using terms like streams and realms, so if you're not familiar with these terms, or you don't fully understand the relationship between recipient addresses, users, and streams in Canit, that background information will help. This video applies to both hosted Canit and on-premises deployments. It was recorded for Canit version 8.1.0. In more recent versions of Canit, options may have changed as the product evolves. If what you see here varies significantly from your Canit experience or confuses you, contact Roaring Penguin Technical Support for clarification. My word, that's an impressively confusing diagram. Don't worry though, as with many things, it seems more challenging to understand on paper than it really is. Also, Canit deploys with reasonable default values that work well in most cases, so if you plan to deploy using the most common options, you'll have hardly anything to worry about. Just follow along and all will make complete sense by the end. The big decision in deploying Canit is how to handle quarantines. Do you want individual quarantines, that is, one stream per user, or will you go with one of the other options? Remember that in Canit we use the term stream to mean a spam quarantine plus all the rules and settings related to it. These other options include one big quarantine per domain. This is useful for small businesses of say 10 or 20 people where one administrator will monitor the quarantine for the whole business and release any false positives as needed. A mix of individual traps for some and a shared quarantine for others. This is the same scenario as above, except power users, or folks like the CEO whose privacy requires it, get their own individual quarantines. If you plan to use our archiver solution for email archiving, it's best to decide up front how you want your streaming to work for the long term, because archiver uses the same streams that spam filtering does. Changing streaming tactics mid-deployment, for example going from one big trap to individual, or changing from one stream per recipient address to a directory lookup, has only a low to moderate impact for just spam filtering, but for Archiver it can make a big difference. Multiple domains with the same user base. This is when your organization has several alias domains, for example RoaringPenguin.com, RoaringPenguin.org, and RoaringPenguin.ca, which all share the same users. Individual traps work well here, as do all the other deployment options, but there are some additional steps to setting this up, so if this will be the case for you, follow along as we discuss individual quarantines and contact Roaring Penguin Technical Support for more information. Okay, now let's jump to individual quarantines, which is by far the most common choice. First, we consider how to stream messages, that is, how to figure out which quarantine to use, and then we consider how to authenticate users when they log into the web interface. The best option is to integrate with a directory if you have one. Either Active Directory or any LDAP directory will work. This allows Canit to look up recipient addresses and find which account they belong to, so it handles aliases automatically. Other methods can handle aliases too, but not as easily. Setting up with Active Directory or LDAP is easy to do. Just create the user lookup and then tell Canit to use it in the domain mapping and authentication mapping areas. We have a video that describes exactly how this is done, including a live demonstration. Without a directory, the most common way to have individual quarantines is one per recipient address, and the most common way to do that is by using the as-is method in domain mapping. With this method, the stream name is the same as the recipient address. We don't chop off or rewrite any part. We leave it as-is. Because the as-is method doesn't have a directory to resolve aliases, an administrator can either map alias recipient addresses to existing stream names manually in the address mappings table, or you can simply let your users claim their alias addresses in the Preferences Alternate Addresses area of the web interface. Without a directory, we'll need a way to authenticate users when they try to log into the web interface. We can do this either using a POP3 or IMAP server, so to do this, simply create the appropriate user lookup and then use it in authentication mapping. Speaking of authentication mappings, it's not really necessary to let your users log into the web interface at all if you don't want to or you don't have IMAP or POP3 available. For almost all deployments, most end users don't bother with the web interface in any event. They can manage their quarantine just using the notification email. 
This is also true if you're using a directory. Just because you can use it to let users log in doesn't mean you need to if you don't want to. That's what that bluish arrow denotes. Without being able to log in, users won't be able to make their own rules or be able to change their individual trap settings and such. Then again, as I already noted, most of them don't bother with these things anyways. It's nice to have for your power users or your more technically savvy ones though. Finally, consider yet another option. If you don't want to let most users log in, but you do want this for just a few power users, you can skip setting up authentication mappings and instead simply create those users internally in Canet. Once again, before we move on, remember that if you're using Archiver, it's best to make sure that you've chosen the right streaming method long term. That's what those two greenish arrows denote. Next, consider how you will validate recipients. Canon needs to know which recipient addresses are valid. We have a video series explaining why recipient verification is important, the different ways Canon can verify recipients, how to set each of them up, etc. But for now, it's enough to go over the options briefly. First, if you're using a directory for streaming, recipient verification is included automatically. Yet another reason to use a directory if you have one. Second, if your backend server is able to reject mail to invalid recipients, Canet can use this ability to test recipient addresses on the fly using plain old SMTP to your backend server. Most mail servers behave this way normally. Exchange can be made to behave this way. This option is the most commonly used one. Most versions of Canet will set this up automatically for you when you add a new domain via the wizard, but it's worth checking to make sure it's there and working if this is the method you will use. Finally, if you have neither a directory nor a backend server that can reject invalid recipients, you can still provide a list of valid recipient addresses directly into Canon. Now it's time to think about default settings. Remember those notification emails I mentioned earlier? Those tell your recipients what items are being held in their spam trap for their review. You get to decide how often you want those to go out. On most Canet systems, if you choose individual streams for your initial deployment through the wizard, then stream setting S950 gets enabled automatically. It is best though if you just quickly visit the stream settings option under the preferences tab to double check it and turn it on if needed. This setting tells Canet to automatically detect the recipient address for each stream's notification email. Next up, training links, false positives, legitimate messages trapped as spam are rare and they are easily dealt with by simply releasing them via the notification email. False negatives, spams that get through to the inbox, are equally rare and they are dealt with by telling Canet to recognize the message as spam for the future by training it. So how can you train false negatives that sneak into your inbox? First, by putting links into the body of the message which users can click on. These can be inline, part of the message text, or a separate attachment that is still visible but separate from the main message text. Second, the links can be put into the header. Then they won't be visible, but technically savvy users can find them and use them, and perhaps more importantly, an end user can send a message to their help desk who can find them and use them. All the settings come with reasonable default values that work well for almost everyone, but while you're in the stream settings section, feel free to review the others. In particular, review our upcoming video on dealing with spam for details about spam thresholds. I don't recommend changing the thresholds right away, but it's something to tuck away in your mind for later. Contact Roaring Penguin Technical Support if you have any questions. Finally, think about user permissions. If you're going to let your users log into the web interface, hence the reddish arrows, you'll need to decide if you want to leave them with permissions to change preferences, make their own rules, etc. Remember that the vast majority of end users don't bother logging into the web interface at all. They manage their quarantines from the notification email exclusively, so the ones who do use the web interface will most likely be your more technically savvy or power users. Therefore, you may want to leave things turned on for them, which is the default. If not though, consider which options you want to restrict your end users to and then contact Roaring Penguin Technical Support. This is something you can do later, after your initial deployment is completed and working, so it's not an immediate concern. It helps to log in as an end user and review the web interface from their perspective to see what you might want to leave on and turn off. And there you have it. Now that you've considered the options and have a good idea of the best way to configure Canet to work for you, it will be a piece of cake to get it done quickly and easily. As always, best wishes, and thank you for watching. No penguins were harmed in the making of this video, but one was quite vociferous.